This is the Asia Trade. I'm Sherian in Tokyo. And I'm Annabelle Drawlers in Hong Kong. The top stories this hour. U.S. stocks and long-term Treasury yields rise as traders position for a second Donald Trump presidency. The Dow at a record high as oil producers, gun makers and private prisons gain. Meanwhile, Trump picks 39-year-old Ohio Senator J.D. Vance as his running mate in a generational shift for Republicans as their convention begins. And Fed Chair Jay Powell flags growing confidence on inflation as traders bolster bets on multiple rate cuts this year. We finally have a running mate for President Trump. Of course, Senator J.D. Vance, a rising star in the Republican Party with his 2016 book depicting the plight of the white working class. Interesting that he was not always a fan of the former president, but he came to really back and embrace that movement. Yeah, that's right. It's been really quite an incredible journey from someone who was never Trump in that camp to becoming Trump's VP pick. But the question, of course, is he's, he's largely unknown to a lot of voters be, beyond writing that book, he'll be el, Hillbilly Elegy. Uh, but what the Democrats, of course, are trying to characterize him is as someone who's Trump 2.0, not only just subservient to the former president, but also to the elite. Take a listen. He's a clone of Trump on the issues. A clone of Trump on the issue. So I don't see any difference. And with politics really being the key theme for U.S. markets, we saw those Trump trades about mentioned earlier, some of these big winners in the oil sector when it comes to private prisons. But we also have those losers in the renewable side of things. Uh, we ended the session slightly higher, near session highs and near record highs for the S&P 500. U.S. futures coming online in the positive right now. But of course, we're watching the Treasury space because we saw the yield curve steepening sort of as we had expected given, of course, President Trump's more loose fiscal policies and trade policies that could end up being inflationary for the economy. We were also trying to digest really earning season. We had banks outperforming Goldman Sachs coming in with better than expected results. We heard from the CEO, David Solomon, talking about the U.S. economy still remaining constructive. Take a listen. On the one hand, there's a high level of geopolitical instability. Elections across the globe could have significant implications for forward policy, and inflation is proven to be stickier than many had anticipated. On the other hand, the environment in the U.S. remains relatively constructive. Markets continue to forecast a soft landing as the expected economic growth trajectory improves and equity markets remain near all-time highs. This is a setup for Asian markets. We could see a little bit of pressure in Asian currencies because we saw the U.S. dollar edge slightly higher again, really touching the session highs after Chair Powell's comments when it came to inflation that, yes, he sounds a little bit more confident, but he still refused to really try to put a time frame for those Fed rate cuts. So take a look at the setup because uh, the Japanese markets are coming back online. We're seeing futures uh, slightly higher. And of course, the ASX 200 touched that record high. So we will be watching if those gains can be sustained. But the question remains for Australia, what happens to its biggest trading partner, China, right? Take a look at how A50 futures were under pressure. We saw uh, the Chinese economic data really coming in poor. Uh, growth numbers for the second quarter slowing uh, to the worst uh, really quarter in five quarters, Bell. Yeah, it certainly adds to the pressure that we're already seeing for President Xi Jinping. But uh, let's shift back to the U.S., of course, because that was what really pushed equities higher in the intraday session. Uh, Donald Trump uh, officially securing the Republican Party's nomination as its presidential candidate just two days after surviving an assassination attempt. Trump, as we were saying, has also announced 39-year-old Ohio Senator J.D. Vance as his running mate, which marks a generational shift for the party. Let's get more from Bloomberg's political news director, to Jody Schneider in Milwaukee. And, and Jody, let's perhaps start off here with this VP pick. As, as we were saying, he's a populist candidate, perhaps, but, but also largely unknown to a lot of voters beyond writing that book, Hillbilly Effort Elegy. Was this a surprise, or, or do, you, do you see the rationale for, for, for Trump's choice here? Yeah, it's a bit of a non-surprise surprise. surprise. Um, he was on the short list of uh, VP candidates, and we've all been playing this <clears throat> Veep Stakes game, as we call it, trying to figure out who 
Donald Trump might choose. And J.D. Vance has long been on that list. Donald Trump's been uh, really uh, talking about this for months. He indicated at one point he'd already decided and he'd announce early and then he was not going to announce until the convention. And of course, this is the first day of the convention and he did announce today. Uh, J.D. Vance has a lot of the same views as Donald Trump, that a so-called populist view that he wants to see uh, America return to, to some former eras. He does not want to see a lot of the kinds of changes, regulatory changes, and other kinds of changes in American society that have occurred over the last few decades. Uh, he, was on, he was a venture capitalist. He's been a businessman, but he's quite young. He's 39 years old, not even 40 years old yet. So as you noted, it really is a generational shift. He is somebody that will uh, you know, bring in that next generation. He is viewed by many people as not being that different than Donald Trump in terms of his stance, his political leanings, and his ideology. Could he also bring a shift when it comes to those key battleground states, given his appeal to the white working class? Well, I think his appeal to the white working class certainly is quite, uh, you know, that is something he does bring to the table. But the real question is going to be those swing state voters, some of them, you know, independent women, uh, uh, racial minorities, is this, res is this message going to resonate with them? Uh, we've heard from some Democrats today saying they actually like this pick because they think it's a starker choice between the Trump ticket and the Biden-Harris ticket. They're hoping that this will actually help them in terms of making a starker contrast uh, with, um, say, women and minority voters. Uh, but we will have to see that's going to be, you know, the campaign uh, uh, the, the campaign slogans and the campaigning and the political ads will be seen in weeks and months to come. But as for swing states, I'm not sure that helps so much. And it used to be you picked a vice presidential candidate uh, to be very a different part of the country, certainly uh, a part of the country you might have wanted to win. Uh, we saw that with John Kennedy and uh, LBJ bringing in LBJ bringing in Texas for him uh, years ago. But now it doesn't seem to matter. Ohio is a solid red state. That is not something that Donald Trump has to worry about. So he wasn't picking him based on that. Mm, Jody Schneider, Bloomberg's political news director, joining us from Milwaukee, where we have the Republican National Convention this week. Of course, the U.S. presidential elections in less than four months, very consequential for the global markets as well. Our next guest is expecting a soft landing for the U.S. economy and positive returns across all asset classes in the next six to 12 months. Joining us now is Shi Chow, financial advisor and managing director at UBS. Shi, always great to have you with us. I just wonder how much of your calculations of positive returns are predicated on the fact that we might get that soft landing finally in the U.S. Because, of course, a president presidential election is really amping up the concerns about more inflationary pressures for the U.S. economy and the Fed not being able to maneuver. Absolutely. I mean, we are certainly expecting a soft, uh, soft, more of a soft landing now, especially after the Fed spoke today. Um, it's a, uh, you know, the economy is pretty strong. We had good earnings. Uh, we are, you know, very close to uh, disinflation. I mean, inflation is really starting to cool off. Uh, solid earnings disinflate potential rate cuts. Um, and really, the technology sector is, uh, you know, extremely propelled by the AI uh, investments. So, uh, you know, with rate cuts, uh, expecting rate cuts, probably first rate cuts in September, maybe even one in December. Uh, you know, the economy is, is, is looking pretty good for a soft landing at this point. Is she... We also got Chair Powell's comments, which sort of gave a boost to the markets, but at the same time, he refused to really map out that time frame when it comes to the Fed rate cuts, and that really sent the U.S. dollar higher. What are the implications of that for the Asian markets then? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, Asian markets right now is, uh, you know, a, a lot of that has to do with uh, still the politics within Asian markets, with the geopolitics. Uh, China is still a big uh, you know, concern. Uh, I mean, I wouldn't say it's concern. China's 
economy is slowing, uh, but China does affect a lot of, uh, you know, the Asian politics surrounding China. So um, China in particular has uh, still have a lot of its own uh, issues with, uh, you know, the property crisis, uh, and then the government really trying to uh, putting national security as, at, at its forefront, and then also uh, becoming a more of a, a superpower, and, you know, hopefully... Uh, China's economy will start to recover a little bit more uh, from 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 some of the economic slowdown from the property crisis, um, and then also you know Japan is a a a, a story as as well with the current um, economy. We're really hoping for more normalization in Japan's economy, um, and uh, South Korea is also a good place uh, to look into. Their you know tech valuations are very very good compared to to some of the rest of the world, especially the U.S. So there's potential that you uh, Asian economy, uh, economies as well. What is it in China that you like in particular? Because as you mentioned, we are just seeing so much weakness there. And even the latest indicators that came out, GDP undershooting retail sales as well, very slow there. So which sectors or areas are, are most of interest to you? I mean, I, I still think some of the China tech sectors, um, those are, you know, uh, in some of the, uh, you know, especially some of the tech sectors that has uh, a lot of the revenue probably coming from overseas. Uh, you know, I think China wants to open up more, uh, wants foreign investments in. Uh, they are just going through a recovery right now. So uh, I think th those are probably the safest to, to invest in and not get... Uh, to into some of the the more of the stocks that will probably get affected by by some of the uh, politics within China. And then shifting, of course, we've seen a lot of outflows from China into places like Japan over the past eighteen months or so. Do you like that market in Japan? And also, second to that, what's your outlook for the Japanese yen? Yeah, I mean the Japanese yen is. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a risk right now. I mean, there's a lot of loans out there. Um, I mean, we could see pullbacks and the U.S. continues to point a soft landing, uh, given that speculative investors' uh, short yen positions are close to a record high right now. So um, I really feel like, you know, a, a lot of the, I mean, this is a good time to probably stay away from Japanese, more Japanese yen loans. Um, and or just taking on higher Japanese yen loans exposure, uh, but the economy itself needs to normalize, um, and and that will still take time. So uh, again, our preferred market at this point is we we still like China. Uh, we 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 also like South Korea, and we like especially some of the South Korean uh, tech valuations at this point. All right, Shi Chow there, financial advisor and managing director at UBS. And as we're hearing from Shi there, positive on the outlook for China, even as pressure is really growing on China's leadership as growth unexpectedly slows. So we're going to discuss that ahead, what this week's third plenum may be able to deliver. Uh, Mizuho Securities also joining us, sharing their investment strategy. Markets are, as we said, raising bets on a Trump presidency. And we'll hear why Goldman Sachs has revised their inflation forecast for Japan. All that's coming up. This is Bloomberg. Fed Chair Jerome Powell says recent economic data is giving officials more confidence that inflation is moving toward their 2% goal. Speaking with Bloomberg host David Rubenstein, Powell highlighted the three latest inflation readings, but did not provide clear timing for a possible rate cut. The uh, labor market remained very strong, unemployment remained very low, and inflation came down at, a, at quite a sharp pace, per, uh, particularly in the second half of the year by a very large amount, and, and uh, um, that forecast uh, was almost unheard of. It was unheard of before 2023, so big upside surprise that year. This year, we had expected the economy to slow a bit gradually, the labor market to continue to gradually cool off after being uh, overheated a couple of years ago, and inflation to continue to make progress. And something like that is, is basically what has happened. 
Uh, the, the economy is growing now at about 1.5% in the first half of the year. Most forecasters have about a 2% growth rate for the full year. The labor market, again, has moved into better and better balance to the point where I think you can now say it's essentially no tighter than it was in 2019 before the pandemic. Remember that the labor market of 2019 was a very strong labor market. So we're back to that place, no longer overheated. On inflation, we in the first quarter, we didn't, we didn't make any more progress. The second quarter, uh, actually, we did make some more progress. We've had now three better readings, uh, and if you average them, it's, it, that's a pretty good pace. So turning to policy, uh, your question, what we said is that we uh, didn't think it would be appropriate to begin to loosen policy until we were more, uh, we had greater confidence that inflation was moving sustainably down to 2%. We'd been waiting on that, and uh, I would say we didn't gain any, any additional confidence in the first quarter, but the three readings in the second quarter, including the one from last week, do add somewhat to confidence. We've also said uh, that you know we're a dual mandate bank. Um, for a long time since inflation arrived, it's been appropriate to focus mainly on inflation, but now that inflation has come down and the labor market has indeed cooled off, uh, we're going to be looking at both mandates. They're, they're much in, better, in much better balance, and that means that if we were to see an unexpected weakening in the labor market, then that might also be a, a reason for reaction by us. Okay, I think I understand. Um, <laughs> so to put it in terms I can for sure understand, um, the markets are suggesting, um, the futures markets, that there's a 90% chance that the Fed will lower its discount rate uh, in September. Do you think the markets know what they're talking about? So, I'm, so today I'm not going to be sending any signals one way or the other on any particular meeting. So just to ruin the fun right at the beginning. Uh, I simply, you know, we, we, we're going to make these decisions meeting by meeting and we're going to make them on the basis of the data as they come in, the evolving data, the evolving outlook. That was the Fed Chair Jay Powell speaking with Bloomberg host and Carlisle co-founder and co-chairman David Rubenstein at the Economic Club of Washington. And uh, market reaction followed those power remarks as well because as he signaled that, that they've got greater confidence around bringing down inflation, we did actually see the dollar or the Bloomberg dollar gauge rising to its highest level of the session on Monday. Uh, off the back of that, we saw G10 currencies largely weakening. This morning, it, it's fairly steady so far. We're also continuing to watch other currencies, of course, the likes of the offshore yuan there. That's weaker, really, off the back of those figures we got out yesterday. We had GDP really undershooting and retail sales as well. Slowest pace of growth we've seen going back to December 2022. And that disappointing uh, performance, really, from China's economy is putting a lot more pressure on President Xi Jinping to stoke growth as Beijing's top leadership meets for a second day to map out economic priorities at the closed third closed door third plenum. For more, let's bring in our Chief North Asia correspondent, Stephen Engel. And, and Steve, it's quite a big task, really, especially when she's trying to transition to a new economy. So exactly how can he get go about it? Yeah, right. I mean, uh, efforts to juice the consumer-led recovery simply have not worked. Uh, and I know David Inglis will talk about this a little bit later on, about, uh, you know, you can bring up the Hang Seng Golden Dragon Index, uh, where it peaked in May 17th and has gone back down about 17 percent since then. And that's simply a proxy and a reflection of uh, the level of confidence in the measures that China has taken uh, to kind of juice this economy. It simply is not happening. And there's lots of uncertainty, obviously. And it was punctuated by the GDP numbers that we got yesterday. 4.7 percent in the second quarter. We're expecting at least 5 percent. That is, by the way, the uh, you know year total or excuse me, target of around 5 percent GDP growth. Whether we're going to hit that or not, uh, you know, that's yet to be seen. Uh, they can still juice it and I use that word for a third time because that's what the market is looking for because they've lost simply uh, some of that confidence. And there's a reason why there hasn't been a lot of news flow coming out of China uh, this week, simply because... All the top leadership are kind of sequestered in a hotel in western Beijing right now. Uh, 400 of the Central Committee members and alternates, as well as uh, ministers, uh, provincial leaders, top academics, uh, military leaders, they're all gathered behind closed doors who are not getting uh, a lot of information, a lot of news flow out of that. So people are just kind of waiting to see what's going to be in that communique on Thursday to see if there's going to be some sort of big bang or some sort of uh, stimulus to help aid in this recovery. Expectations, though, by most people I've spoken to are pretty low right now for that kind of stimulus.
And Steve, how much have President Xi Jinping's efforts to sort of rewire the Chinese economy, perhaps away from those uh, traditional uh, pillars such as manufacturing, to new tech, to renewables, really help the Chinese economy? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they're kind of going back to an old playbook, and that is emphasizing manufacturing with a caveat, and that is a really new quality productive forces. So I was at the National People's Congress where I was there at the press conference uh, when you had the NDRC chair, you had the finance minister, you had the PBOC governor, you had all these top cabinet level ministers all reaffirming what Xi Jinping has called for and that is high tech innovation, at belt tightening on the one hand but also really focusing on provincial core competencies in manufacturing. So you're talking about the new three, whether it's e EVs, solar, uh, and chips, and the like. And that's where we're seeing this emphasis right now, kind of cushioning the slowdown that has been caused by the property crisis and the lack of consumer confidence. In fact, in those yesterday's numbers, while we all focused on that 2% year-over-year rise in retail sales as really underlining the problem with the consumer, you also look at industrial production, which beat expectations. So factory output was 5.3%. We were expecting 5%. So that beat expectations expectations shouldn't be a surprise given the emphasis right now, uh, including behind the closed doors, on high-tech manufacturing, high-quality uh, new productive forces is what's going to likely be emphasized in these four days in Western Beijing at the Third Plenum. Our Chief North Asia Correspondent Stephen Engel there with the latest on the Chinese economy and of course that sneak peek when it comes to today's big take which focuses on China's great rewiring of its economy with the advances in EVs and semiconductors. Subscribers can read the story in full on the terminal and on Bloomberg.com. We have more ahead on the Asia trade. This is Bloomberg. After a long fight against very um, high and persistent inflation, inflation is coming down and it's doing so in a way that is, we're gro confidence is growing that we are getting near a sustainable pace of getting inflation back down to 2%, which is the commitment and the goal that we have. San Francisco Fed President Mary Daly on the central bank's inflation outlook and the expectation that inflation will come back. Of course, a key risk is what happens after the U.S. presidential elections. Are we going to get more inflationary pressures because of fiscal policies, because of trade policies? Perhaps that was some of the expectation that we saw in the Treasury space overnight. Take a look at how futures are trading at the moment because in the Wall Street session, we had long-dated bonds leading the losses on bets that President Trump's uh, policies could fan inflationary pressures pressures. We had the yield curve steepening. The 30-year yield rising above the two-year yield for the first time since January briefly. And of course, markets were also digesting Chair Powell's comments on having confidence that the inflation is headed down, but still not really committing to rate cuts. This is Bloomberg. This is the Asia Trade. We're about 30 minutes away from the major market opens. Here are the top stories that you should know. Donald Trump has named Ohio Senator J.D. Vance as his running mate, marking a generational shift for the Republican Party. The announcement came as the convention confirmed Trump as the party's presidential candidate. President Biden has responded by calling Vance a Trump clone. Traders have added to bets the Federal Reserve will, will cut interest rates several times this year. Chair Jay Powell says recent data has provided greater confidence that inflation is heading towards the 2% target. And Goldman Sachs trading unit powered the surge in earnings in the second quarter. Both fixed income and equity trading outpaced analyst estimates. Still, the Wall Street giant reported a big miss in advisory fees and says it plans to moderate buybacks. And this was really the interesting part, Bell, right? I mean, 
Goldman Sachs usually does pretty well when it comes to arranging mergers, but it actually fell uh, short of J.P. Morgan. And this business is more important for Goldman Sachs, especially after they abandoned the consumer business. So we were watching this closely, and the thing is that there are more risks ahead for the advisory business and deals, given that we do have, as we have been talking about all week, the U.S. elections coming up. So the pace of growth in the merger section uh, could be a little bit pressured than in recent years years. Yeah, that's right, Sherry. What was interesting as well out of the Goldman numbers was just how much it's managing to raise for private credit. And, and we really have seen the explosion of that sort of deal making or financing as well. But they've got this new direct lending fund uh, raising around $20 billion or just north of $20 billion for that. Uh, so that was the Goldman earnings. If we're in the midst of, of a lot of earnings season, though, for the big banks. Uh, the next one's coming up. We've got Morgan Stanley, for instance. That's going to be reporting results before the bell on Tuesday. Tuesday, uh, really want to understand as well, how did equities trading go? Because you had good results from the likes of JP Morgan, Citigroup as well. And then Bank of America, that's another one to be watching out for because you've got uh, the lower net interest income, higher wage or higher cost rather. That's been weighing on earnings across the spectrum. Uh, don't forget as well, you can turn to your Bloomberg for more on those numbers. Go to TLive Go to get commentary and analysis from Bloomberg's expert editors. That's the story with the banks. Uh, let's shift now to what we're seeing in the tech space as well, because we've got a Bloomberg scoop. Uh, sources telling us that Apple's annual sales in India hit a record of almost $8 billion. That's as the firm seeks to diversify its revenue sources beyond China. For more, let's bring in our senior tech editor, Nick Turner. And Nick, $8 billion, of course, it's, it's, it's a lot of money at face value. But still, when you take a look at Apple's sales in India, it, it really just makes up a fraction of the overall pie. So how significant is this and how much more can Apple grow from here, do you think, in India? Well, yeah, as you say, I mean, you look at China, which is $73 billion a year. So it's still a tiny fraction of that. Um, but... Uh, CEO Tim Cook has pointed to India a few times now in conference calls as really being a, a big growth opportunity. And it is, it's the most populous country on earth, obviously, and a growing middle class. And Apple in Asia is kind of a luxury brand. So there's two ways to grow. Obviously, you get people to spend a bit more on their phones or you just try to sell more lower cost phones. Either one is a potential a way that Apple could grow further in that market. Nick, uh, as you say, I mean, in the cheaper space, you do have Apple competing with other devices powered by Android. And at the same time, you have the weak economic numbers out of China. Who wants to spend more on these luxury phones would be a question. What are the risks in this market? Well, in China, it's been an interesting one because Apple was, you know, certainly suffering a pretty bad slowdown there they've relied on discounts to prop up the iphone and it does seem like it's helped in terms of of, of spurring demand there um but it's you know long term obviously you want to be able to preserve demand at, at your full price and get people just continue to see the iphone as a is a, a desirable luxury good and and i think that's worked pretty well in china for years and so there may be questions going forward of how whether that's working as well or will work what about beyond just selling phones in the country because we know apple already has some manufacturing operations in india are we likely to see an expansion there do you think oh uh, for sure i mean the trajectory in india i think the the production amount of sort of iphones that were made there doubled last year so certainly that seems like it's going to continue on that trajectory and any way that's that apple can kind of diversify its supply chain and rely a little less on china i think that's going to be good for the company long term no matter what happens i don't think it's ever going to walk away from china as a market or a production hub but it certainly doesn't hurt to be a little more diversified our senior tech editor nick turner there with the latest on apple and the latest from the corporate front, Bloomberg has learned that Salesforce has cut about 300 roles as part of its broader effort to streamline operations. Sources tell us the software giant made the cuts this month following earlier rounds of job losses starting at the beginning of 2023. It's the latest example of the tech industry reining in costs following years of rapid hiring.
Stripe's valuation has edged up to $70 billion as Sequoia Capital offers to buy shares from investors looking to cash out. Sources say Sequoia is offering to buy Stripe shares at over $27, with the venture capital firm reportedly buying up to $861 million in shares. Stripe helps merchants process customer payments and was recently valued at $65 billion. Swatch Group shares slumped the most in four years after sales and profit both tumbled on slowing Chinese demand. The group's brands, including Omega, Blank Pain, and Harry Winston, saw a 70% drop in operating profit and double-digit fall in sales in the first half. The firm says it's slashing production by 20% to ride out the downturn. Well, Sherry, we're just uh, over 20 minutes away now from the open in Sydney, Seoul and Tokyo. Tokyo, of course, coming back from an extended break. But this is the outlook here we've got for futures. It's very, very flat, even though you see US ones continuing to push a little higher. What we are expecting in the session today is pretty much muted trading or a little bit mixed as well. Even though you did have that tailwind from the US, you've got uh, Powell, of course, saying that inflation is coming back under control. You've also got Donald Trump picking his uh, vice president pick or, or naming him J.D. Vance, uh, someone who is seen as really continuing those populist policies. But that is what we're seeing there for futures as we look ahead to the opens. We'll have more ahead. This is Bloomberg. Well, China's leaders are gathering for a twice a decade economic meeting and we've seen those economic indicators, GDP undershooting, weakness in retail sales, certainly putting pressure for further support to come through. What President Xi is really backing on or betting on is that manufacturing and high tech sectors are going to be the ones that help propel growth forward. Let's bring in our guest to discuss is Marina Yujang, Associate Professor at the Australia-China Relations Institute at the University of Technology in Sydney. And, and Marina, let's just start off a bit bigger picture here, because when you do have that bet on manufacturing, on high tech, things like semiconductors, solars, EVs, we've seen those really becoming the focus of, of protectionist policies from the likes of the US and Europe. But what about the areas that sit underneath this? Because you look at critical minerals, for instance, is that going to also enter the fray here as being something that could be a key focus point for these different Western powers? Sure, definitely. Um, the US and China tech race has extended to uh, beyond the semiconductors, AI technologies, to critical minerals, because critical minerals are integral to the, uh, the high high tech manufacturing, including um, smartphones, smart devices, and and the, and uh, renewable energy uh, transition technologies and EVs. So that will be uh, another center for the US-China tech race in uh, from now on. And how do you see it sort of playing out? Because China controls so much of, of the, the production chain for those critical minerals as well, even though the world needs them. So you do need to have some element of cooperation, perhaps. Yes, of, of course. I mean, uh, different from uh, semiconductors, uh, where China actually uh, faces several critical bottlenecks uh, because China doesn't yet have the critical technologies, especially in chip making uh, equipment and technologies. But China does control the, ma uh, the majority of the value chain in critical minerals, uh, from extraction to smelting, uh, processing, and the downstream applications. So that gives China a um, uh, uh, certain advantages, but on the other hand, uh, that makes a critical mineral as a highly uh, geopolitical sensitive area where well, China is facing a, a, a dilemma uh, as the, uh, the, le the top leaders now, uh, today, yesterday and today, um, are focusing on focusing on China's further development um, on two things. One is high quality opening up, and the other one is innovation-driven development. But these two things actually are a bit contradictory to each other because uh, um, high 
high quality opening up in, in requires a, a foreign invest foreign direct investment into China technology exchange but on the other hand uh, in the in the heated up tech re race between China and the US China has to develop its technology sovereignty including protecting its critical minerals and China can leverage its its dominance in critical min mineral value chain so this will become a very highly uh, geopolitical sensitive area what about for, for countries like Australia, for instance, that's, that's a key exporter of some of these minerals that are critical to areas like EVs, for instance? It's really had to walk a very fine line between uh, appeasing the US and also China. So how does that increase geopolitical focus weigh on countries or governments like in Canberra? You're absolutely right. Australia is actually in a very um, awkward position because um, uh, in, in, in national security sense, Australia is obviously US ally uh, in Asia Pacific. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, Australia relies on China's um, processing capabilities to 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 produce um for example battery battery grade chemicals to supply the mass demand uh, downstream so for australian um, as one of the few um suppliers on the supply chain uh, but mean, meanwhile as the u.s ally it is quite difficult uh, for australian to maintain the balance because all the other uh, most of most of suppliers on the supply chain actually are not U.S. allies directly. Uh, for example, those countries in 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 Latin America, uh, in Africa, and even in Belt and Road Initiative countries. Uh, so Australia is facing a, an increasing challenge to maintain the balance between the two. Marina, we've been talking about how crucial these critical minerals are in the development of new technologies. We've been focused on the geopolitical ramifications against China really dominating this industry for more than a decade now. How much has been done over the years to diversify away from China? We know that this is a very challenging thing to do. Well, in terms of technology, uh, China is, uh, is catching up, but China still... Um, the, the, the advantages of China's um, um, dominance actually in the mass production uh, side. So that means China actually has achieved this uh, cost effectiveness ways of making this 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 minerals, uh, in, including in the in the uh, high high tech manufacturing uh, such as EVs. So to to build a China plus one uh, supply chains um, is one story, but to Decoupling from China is a different story because uh, for for the for for the rest of the world to replicate a supply chain and wait and and uh, and uh, uh, meeting the requirement of cost effectiveness within a short space of time is very challenging. Uh, the reason is because China's advantages is 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 its very short supply chains within the country, sometimes within a geo. Ge geological uh, ge geographic clusters in a certain area so this this gives china's cost advantages for all the other countries across different uh, different continents in uh, globally it is very difficult to meet to meet such um, a cost effectiveness uh, as china has today why is transparency and sustainability in the critical mineral supply chain important it is important. Um, the reason is um, the, the 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 origin of uh, of critical minerals. Well, um, the, the quite a bit of uh, of it is used in um, renewable energies, high technology uh, manufacturing, and some to the defense systems. So to maintain a sustainable and uh, a transparent value chain is important for both renewable energies and defense systems. Otherwise, downstream users will not have ease, uh, ease, ease of mind to use those, 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 um, uh, those uh, critical minerals. That was Marina Yujung, the Associate Professor at, of the Australia-China Relations Institute at the University of Technology, Sydney. Thanks so much for joining us this morning. And let's uh, shift to...
to a different theme in Australia this morning because critics are warning that a US deal to share nuclear submarine technology with the UK and also Canberra is becoming bogged down in delays. Analysts have told Bloomberg the so-called AUKUS partnership has made little tangible progress in the three years since it was announced. For more, let's bring in our Australia government reporter Ben Westcott in Canberra. And Ben, even people that were advocates or supporters of, of AUKUS are even starting to question where it's going. So, so what's, what's the latest on this? And, and will we see any sort of tangible benefits from the AUKUS agreement anytime soon? Well, if you were to ask any of the three governments involved, they'd say the whole thing is very much on track and that, uh, you know, you should, you know, it's on track to have the first submarine delivered to Australia around 2032 from the US, those Virginia class nuclear submarines, and that the stage, uh, the pillar two, the technological benefits are also on their way. But what we heard speaking to people uh, who are in the know behind the scenes, uh, there's a lot of uncertainty about exactly how well the AUKUS project is getting on. Um, one thing we heard a lot is that the US Virginia class submarines are not being produced fast enough to potentially sell some surplus ones to Australia in 2032. And then on the other hand, we heard that there's a lot of business uncertainty as to what exactly the technology sharing part of the agreement actually will entail. That's known as pillar two in AUKUS speak. Uh, and there's a lot of um, questions in business about, you know, what, what will the practical commercial outcome of Pillar 2 and when will we get some more sort of colouring in uh, between the lines about what exactly that will mean. And I guess questions about what happens to AUKUS after the US elections. Well, so for this article, we spoke to former Prime Minister, Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison. He recently met with Donald Trump at Trump Tower, uh, and he came out of that meeting saying that it was a very warm discussion around AUKUS, and he was convinced that AUKUS would be safe in a Trump presidency, or at least, you know, not no significant changes. However, Mr Morrison wouldn't go into any detail about what exactly he how he took that from his meeting with uh, Donald Trump, what exactly Trump said. And so uh, as a result of that, uh, you know, there will continue to be questions up till the moment uh, Donald Trump is sworn to office if he wins uh, as to what exactly his feelings towards AUKUS are and, and what it would mean under a Trump presidency. We've got a, a quote in your article this morning, Ben, saying that if you fast forward 10 years, some people that you've spoken to would say they'd be shocked if, if Australians have a submarine. So is there any possibility here or how strong is that possibility that August isn't going to be delivering? Look, I think that at this stage for Australia, and we quote several experts on this as well, it kind of has to deliver because Australia has remade its entire military around AUKUS, around these submarines. Australia is investing in missile capability and drone capability that is designed to function in collaboration with a nuclear submarine fleet. Now, if the fleet doesn't turn up, then that's going to be quite awkward for the Australian, Australian military. I mean, the idea that we'll end up with nothing in Australia is, is more of an outlier. People mostly say that there probably will eventually be some outcomes from this. But it was Prime Minister Scott Morrison that really hit on um, some of the, the, you know, real functional questions, uh, saying, telling us for the first time that he wants to see some more clarity around, um, you know, what exactly Australia can expect to get from the technology sharing partnership uh, and wanting to see results on that in the next 12 months. A pretty stark statement for someone who was involved, who was involved in that original signing of the AUKUS deal. Australia government reporter Ben Westcott there. We have more ahead on the Asia trade. This is Bloomberg. Flows from U.S. ETFs tracking Chinese equities have persisted for a sixth straight week as weaker economic data and implications of a Trump victory spook investors. Our China correspondent Min Min Lo joins us here in Hong Kong. And, and Min Min, we know the markets have been under pressure, but, but how much of this latest 
outflows that we're seeing, how much is that a story of the economic data? How much is it investors being concerned about Trump possibly returning to the White House? Yeah, it's actually a little bit of both. And last week, we saw record high outflows from China ETFs in the US uh, of close to 230 million. The top ETF, uh, which is the K-Web, which tracks the China, the Golden Dragon China Index, saw outflows of over 120 million. And that's, as you said, we saw this string of very disappointing data coming out of China in the last few weeks. The import data really collapsing to negative levels. And then you have, gro you have growth data as well. Uh, showing that growth is slowing to uh, its weakest in five quarters. And retail sales as well, missing, missing expectations by a wide margin, staying at around 2%, inflation just hovering above zero, and property as well, uh, remaining weak. Home prices yesterday was t disappointing, um, given the PBOC's plan to roll out their rescue plan in May. And then externally, you have that attempted assassination of Trump that has raised bets that he could go all the way to the White House in November. Um, and so, you know, investors are just taking a very cautious approach here, waiting and see to see how that plenum turns out and that economic meeting, the July Politburo meeting at the end of the month turns out, yeah. Something else we're going to be tracking today for mainland bourses is, is the two ETFs that track the Tadawul in Saudi Arabia. They're starting to list today. What are the expectations around that? Yeah, the expectations are quite positive. We reported in June that the regulators had approved the listing of these two funds in Shanghai and Shenzhen. They are going to track the CSOP Saudi Arabia ETF that debuted in Hong Kong last November. And obviously, this is part of the deepening financial ties between China and Saudi Arabia as China tries to expand its global partnership amid what it sees as Washington uh, trying to weaponize economic policy. So this cross-listing will allow that ETF to tap into that two 200 million strong investors um, in China who are very hungry for overseas listings now, uh, overseas ETFs, given that weak domestic um, right. stock market slump so far. Our China correspondent, Min Min Lo, there with the latest on the Chinese equity markets. And of course, we are headed towards uh, Seoul, Tokyo and Sydney open with pressure on yields already around Australia. This is Bloomberg. This is the Asia Trade. We're counting down to Asia's major market opens. After another session of gains on Wall Street, we have the Treasury yield curve bell steepening on expectations that President Trump could win the presidency. Of course, those are the expectations that we might see his fiscal and trade policies become more inflationary, and that's really affecting the Treasury markets. We already have his pick for running mate, J.D. Vance. Yeah, that's right. Big question whether you get that looser fiscal policy, higher tariffs. Does that sort of constrain the Fed moving forward? But on the flip side, we also had that interview with Jay Powell as well, those comments around inflation and his view that it's coming back under control, Sherry. Yeah, take a look at how we're opening in the Asian session because those comments by Chair Powell sent the dollar much higher because he still refrained from giving a timing of those rate cuts. So we could see the Japanese yen going through another roller coaster ride. We're seeing already a little bit of pressure against the Japanese currency. Remember, after those huge gains that we saw last week and speculation that authorities might have intervened. And now stock markets coming back online after a holiday. We are seeing a little bit of a catch up, up four tenths of one percent. Take a look at how the Cosby is coming online because it actually saw some pressures in the previous session. The Korean won was one of the biggest losers in the Asian currency space. We are now seeing a little bit of a mixed picture and the tech heavy caused that under pressure, Bell. Yeah, and also Aussie markets coming online this morning. Take a look at the ASX 200 there. You're above 8,000. We closed above that level yesterday for the first time ever. Every single sector was in the green yesterday. Today, perhaps there's a little bit of profit taking, a little bit of just 
uh, wait and see. Uh, there's other things to note as well. You've got the geopolitical tensions between uh, the US and China, that weakness in China's economy as well. Uh, plus, we had Jay Powell as well speaking overnight, talking about his outlook for, for inflation, price pressures he's seeing coming under control. That also played out in, in demand for Treasuries. Three six-month auctions really dipping on Monday with these expectations that we could get rate cuts perhaps sooner rather than later. Take a listen. On inflation, we, in the first quarter, we didn't, we didn't make any more progress. The second quarter, uh, actually, we did make some more progress. We've had now three better readings, uh, and if you average them, it's, it, that's a pretty good pace. Let's bring in Sean Darby, Managing Director at Mizuho Securities Asia. And, and Sean, let's uh, kick off with, with what we heard from Jay Powell there. These, these growing expectations, perhaps inflation is, is coming under control. And perhaps the stage is really, truly being set finally for the Fed to start cutting rates. Well, I think the, the biggest variable for the Fed was always shelter. Shelter has been mm. misbehaving for some time. And I think that's now coming in line. I think the difficulty for the Fed is that sticky inflation as measured by the Atlanta Fed is still running around 4%. So there's got to be a little bit of concern that if they do cut and the economy revives that they go back to the same problem uh, that they've had for the last nine months which is that service inflation uh, remains much more problematic. But by and largely I think the markets have been right to steepen uh, the curve to steepen because I think uh, the Fed will take any opportunity now to cut rates coming into year Year end. It wants to have some sort of insurance policy just in case uh, unemployment numbers start to rise. And, and as well, we've got that price action also reflecting the, the odds that Trump returns to the White House. How are you thinking about that in the calculations that you're making? Well, I, I think um, in, a, in, a, in a sense uh, you are going to get some fiscal looseness, mainly from the fact that uh, the tax cuts both for corporates and for households will be re relatively inflationary. And in the first instance, uh, you're going to also have a, a combination of uh, monetary easing as well. So fiscal and monetary easing means uh, generally a more inflationary backdrop and probably a weaker dollar as well. And so how do you see that sort of playing out when, you, when you're making you, your forecast for the Asian region? Well, I think uh, you're going to uh, get a period in which, well, I think we're just going through a mid-cycle correction, really. We've had a manufacturing recession in parts of the developed world, but relatively robust data in emerging markets. And a weaker monetary policy in the United States is perfect for EM at the moment. They've got a lot of room to cut uh, rates because inflation in, in e Asia and EM is very well behaved. Um, so in that sense, um, uh, sort of economies could you know, re-expand in 2025. And that, in a sense, would be very, very good for, for Asian and EM equity markets. What if China underperforms? Because the economic data that we're seeing recently doesn't look very good. Well, I, I don't disagree with you. I think the, perhaps the worst uh, economic data release was consumer confidence, which actually relapsed again almost to record lows. So in, th in that regard, uh, the PBOC is going to do, have to do a lot of the heavy lifting. And as you saw um, last week, it's, it's sort of intent really in putting, a, in, putting in place a uh, yield curve control. Um, so I think what, um, China is work in progress, I think, um, and the best, perhaps the best thing at the moment is that the general global trade environment, notwithstanding tariffs, is actually pretty good. And you've seen the export data holding up in China as you have, have across the region. So if anything, um, China's been relatively um, lucky that, and, fortunate, and very fortunate that the, the global economy has been uh, running at just over 3%, and that's meant its export machine has actually done, done relatively well, despite what has been a pretty catastrophic uh, consumer and, and of course, uh, a very, very difficult uh, real estate uh, sector. Today's big take focus has been on that rewiring that we saw from President Xi Jinping on the Chinese economy focused more towards high tech, renewable energies. Does that translate in uh, the fact that we should be looking at those sectors in the markets as well when making those investments? I mean, we have seen this narrative play out for quite some time, those bets when where Beijing is really focused in, how much more can those sectors rise at this point, given the broader weakness? 
So when you do look at the, um, the tech sector, it, it really translates into the value-added um, um, output in China. And the best uh, correlation, I think, for that is um, the, actually the Starboard Index in China. If you, if you look at those companies, these were all uh, germinated and uh, created really from the Made in China uh, theme that started in 2015. Uh, the majority of these companies are still loss-making, um, but they do sort of represent the core Mittelstand of China, the small medium enterprises. I think, um, like everywhere else, uh, the, 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 this equity market, uh, the Starboard, just like uh, the HS Tech Index and the CSI 300, are all under the cloud of the fact that real interest rates in China are still positive, and that tends to mean a pretty good environment for bonds and a pretty bad environment for equities. So not too much read-through, I think, uh, uh, from what's been happening in the tech sector for the uh, for Chinese equities, because the story really is all about bond, the bond markets in China, and until they sort of uh, re, re-engineer the consumer, I, I think that's still going to be very much the, the theme there, irrespective of how well uh, the tech sector's been doing. Re-engineering the consumer seems like a pretty tall order, but uh, let's uh, shift to tech in a, in a different place, because you're also very bullish on, on Taiwan. Why does it stand out to you so much when a lot of investors are just concerned about that geopolitical risk as well? I think Taiwan at the moment is a perfect marriage between excellent macro. You've got very low, relatively low inflation. You've got record high foreign exchange reserves, booming current account surplus, um, and at the same time, you've got PMI for tech orders in Taiwan near record highs and infantries near record lows. So the macro and micro in Taiwan now is probably the best since really 2000 when we had the internet boom. And I think also that people, investors have had to get over the geopolitic political risks. And that always means that there's quite a bit of catch up. Uh, try in, in, in equity markets, and I think Taiwan has been the perfect sort of sort of play on that. Um, I, I think we, we we've never seen Taiwan. I think, as I say, going until 2000, being in such a position with you, but also a record cheap currency as well. So it's um, I think it's probably going to be a standout globally. I mean, it's up nearly 25% year to date mm. in dollar terms. And I, you know, again, from where you where we were 18 months ago, this equity market is still delivering very good earnings and great economic releases as well. Sean Darby of Mizuho Securities Asia, really great to have you with us. And of course, we have been talking about geopolitical risk across Asia, perhaps one of the calculations that Apple has expanded so aggressively in India. And Bloomberg has now learned that annual sales in India for Apple hit a record of almost $8 billion. So to say, the India revenue jumped about 33% in the 12 months through March. Of course, Apple has been targeting India as a way to diversify its manufacturing and revenue sources beyond the much larger market still of China. These are the Asian suppliers uh, trading early in the Asia session. This is Bloomberg. President Biden on Donald Trump choosing 39-year-old Ohio Senator J.D. Vance as his running mate. And you're taking a look at live pictures from the Republican National Convention. While underway in Milwaukee, Trump and Vance have now officially secured the Republican Party's nomination as its official ticket for the November election. White House and politics reporter Gregory Corti joins us now live from Milwaukee. Greg, great to have you with us. So tell us a little bit about what the vice presidential pick J.D. Vance brings to the table for Trump's uh, really uh, attempt to gain a second term at the White House. 
Yeah, well, the most obvious thing is the age difference. This is a generational shift. Uh, the, the, President, uh, former President Trump is 78 years old. J.D. Vance is about half that. He's, he's 39. Uh, and he's only you know four years older than than you need to be constitutionally to, to serve as president. So there's a little bit of a passing of the torch that way. And of course, given uh, President Joe Biden's uh, problems with the eight, dealing with this age issue, that's notable in and of itself. But Vance is also just has a little bit of a different resume. He's what I call the literary face of the Trump movement. He wrote a book, a memoir, uh, a few years ago about growing up in, an, uh, in a mountain uh, town, uh, industrial part of the country that uh, really was decimated by some of the the global uh, trade uh, that that really reshaped the economy. But then also he went on to go to, to law school. He worked in tech and venture capital for a while, made some connections with some people like Peter Thiel and, and Steve Case of, of, of AOL. And so he really brings those Silicon Valley connections and some tech policy chops to the ticket. So yeah, it, it's a, an interesting choice and, and it balances uh, some of Trump's weaknesses with some of Vance's strengths. Do you think though, the flip side perhaps, this is someone who, who largely mirrors Trump's thinking in, in many respects. Do you think then it, it hurts the appeal of the party to voters that have had troubles coming to grips with things like Trump's views or, or the party's views on things like abortion rights? Yeah, ideologically, they are very simpatico. There's not a whole lot of daylight uh, from them. Sometimes, you know, a, a presidential candidate might select uh, a, a more moderate candidate to reach out to the middle. Also, very often, uh, presidential candidates will reach out to their a little bit to their right or to their left, uh, depending on the party, to kind of solidify the base. And we saw that when uh, George W. Bush picked Dick Cheney to sort of uh, mollify conservatives. Trump did that himself when he picked uh, uh, Vice President Mike Pence as his running mate in 2016 uh, to, to kind of build a bridge to conservatives. So uh, in this case, I don't see necessarily an, any sort of ideological movement with this. And I'm not sure that it makes a whole lot of difference, uh, given that voters usually don't really vote on the bottom half of the ticket. They vote on the top half of the ticket. But as we just heard from uh, President Biden, uh, he sees Vance as a clone of Trump. And so you can very much expect Democrats to uh, attack Trump on the issues and attract Vance in very much the same way. Gregory, so you're in Milwaukee right now. Tell us a little bit about the mood that you're seeing at the RNC after the shooting attempt on Donald Trump and, of course, uh, what we can expect the rest of the week. Yeah, this is uh, a, a remarkably unified party, given all of the the chaos that we saw uh, during the, the sort of the first Trump administration, what we saw in the primaries earlier this year with Trump being challenged by a dozen other members of his own party for the nomination. Nikki Haley continued to receive considerable number of votes uh, deep into the, the nomination fight, even after Trump had clinched the nomination. All that has fallen away. Uh, Nikki Haley is expected to speak at this convention. Uh, many of Trump's former adversaries in the Republican Party have lined up behind him. Uh, the shooting has a lot to do with that, galvanizing the party around uh, that event. And so there's also sort of a very much a feeling of optimism all of a sudden that Trump's uh, election may be inevitable even. This is a very confident party. What I'm looking for in the, in the next few days is just how Trump plays that assassination attempt, whether he makes good on his promises to call for a moment of national unity, to tone down the rhetoric a little bit, to, to reach across the center and, and to try to uh, lower the temperature, as President Biden put it, uh, given what happened on Saturday. All right, that was Gregory Cordy, the White House and politics reporter live from Milwaukee. Uh, let's shift because, of course, that focus very much from the Chinese side, what this possible return of Trump to the White House means against the backdrop of the plenum that's getting underway, a disappointing second quarter economic performance as well, putting a lot more pressure on President Xi Jinping to stoke growth. Uh, let's get more on this now. As we said, that closed door third plenum into its second day. Our Chief North Asia correspondent, Stephen Engel, joins us and Steve I mean it wasn't a great start yesterday when you think yeah. Lenin got underway economic data comes out 
broad picture of weakness. C clearly, the Chinese economy is sputtering, and they've tried to get uh, it kick-started, and that's why we saw like uh, the Golden Dragon Index as a proxy to the economy uh, kind of go up in May. May 17th is down 15% since then, because that momentum has kind of petered out. So people are looking at the plenum to see what could possibly come from behind those closed doors uh, as kind of a stimulus. Uh, but again, we're not expecting a big bang. But then again, uh, Xi Jinping is an unconventional leader, uh, and perhaps, uh, look, this third plenum was delayed by six or seven months uh, because it's usually held within that year after the party congress. They delayed it. There's been some headwinds, obviously, and they need to address that, or do they? We have to see uh, whether it's going to be structural reform uh, and uh, simply kind of, uh, you know, boosting the coffers and the fiscal structures at the provincial levels, perhaps raising the retirement age. Uh, some of the things that wouldn't get the big headlines, like stimulus for the property sector, rescue package for the property sector, stimulus to help the consumer uh, spend some money. Because again, these geopolitics are behind everything uh, that we are talking about right now. Uh, so if J.D. Vance is m mimicking, if you will, or basically echoing the same kind of dare I say, not my words, protectionist sentiment and the stance towards China. That is something obviously in Beijing right now, the leadership as they collect behind closed doors for now the second day of four days to kind of give long-term economic structure and strategy they have to figure in the Trump equation, obviously, on the export front. Mm, and the export front, of course, it's, it's about solar, EVs. They're trying to develop, at least for domestic purposes, their chip sector as well. These are all of the new economy drivers, yes. and it's that question around sustainability that we're also talking about in today's Big Take. That's right. The Big Take is, is, a, is the counter-argument to what we've been seeing with the numbers yesterday. With GDP coming in at 4.7%, we were expecting 5%. Retail sales was the real number, iPod number mm. to the downside, 2% growth. Uh, again, we haven't seen these numbers in quite some time. We were expecting 3.4%. So that's telling you the consumer's not there. So what do they do? They go back to that old cocktail, and that is pump out manufacturing across the provinces to boost growth that way. And that was reflected in the factory output. The industrial production numbers was 5.3%. We were expecting 5%. That should not be a surprise given the emphasis on new quality productive forces so, again, it's the old cocktail, but it's new products. So it's AI. It is, to a certain degree, in manufacturing as well. It's chips. It's EVs. It's solar panels. It's uh, areas of, of strategic importance of national security. And this goes back to the geopolitical question as well. If you need self-reliance because of more protectionist measures possibly coming down the pike in the United States, you throw the money towards that. Stephen Engel, our chief North Asia correspondent, and we'll actually get more on the challenges that Chinese leaders face. Coming up, we'll discuss its growth goals with Goldman Sachs later this hour. And we also have Moody's sharing their views later in the China show. This is Bloomberg. Fed Chair Jay Powell says recent economic data is giving officials more confidence that inflation is moving toward their 2% goal. Speaking with Bloomberg host David Rubenstein, Powell highlighted the latest three inflation readings but didn't provide clear timing for a possible rate cut. The uh, labor market remained very strong, unemployment remained very low, and inflation came down at, a, at quite a sharp pace, per, uh, particularly in the second half of the year, by a very large amount. and, and uh, um, that forecast uh, was almost unheard of. It was unheard of before 2023. So big upside surprise that year. This year, we had expected the economy to slow a bit gradually, the labor market to continue to gradually cool off after being uh, overheated a couple of years ago, and inflation to continue to make progress. And something like that is, is basically what has happened. Uh, the, the economy is growing now at about 1.5% in the first half of the year. Most forecasters have about a 2% growth rate for the full year. The labor market, again, has moved into better and better balance to the point where I think you can now say 
it's essentially no tighter than it was in 2019 before the pandemic. Remember that the labor market of 2019 was a very strong labor market. So we're back to that place, no longer overheated. On inflation, we in the first quarter, we didn't, we didn't make any more progress. The second quarter, uh, actually, we did make some more progress. We've had now three better readings, uh, and if you average them, it's, it, that's a pretty good pace. So turning to policy, uh, your question, what we said is that we uh, didn't think it would be appropriate to begin to loosen policy until we were more, uh, we had greater confidence that inflation was moving sustainably down to 2%. We've been waiting on that, and uh, I would say we didn't gain any, any additional confidence in the first quarter, but the three readings in the second quarter, including the one from last week, do add somewhat to confidence. We've also said uh, that you know we're a dual mandate bank. Um, for a long time since inflation arrived, it's been appropriate to focus mainly on inflation, but now that inflation has come down and the labor market has indeed cooled off, uh, we're going to be looking at both mandates. They're, they're much in, better, in much better balance, and that means that if we were to see an unexpected weakening in the labor market, then that might also be a, a reason for reaction by us. Okay, I think I understand. Um, <laughs> so to put it in terms I can for sure understand, um, the markets are suggesting, um, the futures markets, that there's a 90% chance that the Fed will lower its discount rate uh, in September. Do you think the markets know what they're talking about? So, I'm, so today I'm not going to be sending any signals one way or the other on any particular meeting. So just to ruin the fun right at the beginning. Uh, I simply, you know, we, we, we're going to make these decisions meeting by meeting, and we're going to make them on the basis of the data as they come in, the evolving data, the evolving outlook. Fed Chair Powell speaking with Bloomberg host and Carlisle co-founder and co-chairman David Rubenstein at the Economic Club of Washington. Take a look at how European futures are trading in the Asian session. We saw downside pressure during the regular session, given that we had some weak Chinese economic data, of course, but also some disappointing updates from the likes of Swatch Group and Burberry Group as well. So we have the stocks Europe 600 falling by almost a percent, and you can see the downside continuing in the futures session with the euro stock. Stocks 50 futures down two tenths of one percent. The euro holding steady, although after Chair Powell's comments, we had a little bit of a spike when it came to the U.S. dollar that pressured all the other side of that trade, including the euro and, of course, Asian currencies. We'll continue to watch the repercussions throughout the Asian session as we head towards the China Open after that disappointing economic data, including slowing growth in China uh, by the worst pace in five quarters. This is Bloomberg. We're about 30 minutes into trading in Asia, and here are the top stories you should know. Donald Trump has named Ohio Senator J.D. Vance as his running mate, marking a generational shift for the Republican Party. The announcement came as the convention confirmed Trump as the party's presidential candidate. President Biden has responded by calling Vance a Trump clone. Traders have added to bets the Federal Reserve will cut interest rates several times this year. Chair Jay Powell says recent data has provided greater confidence that inflation is heading toward the 2% target. And Goldman Sachs' trading unit powered a surge in earnings in the second quarter. Both fixed income and equity trading outpaced analyst estimates. Still, the Wall Street giant reported a big miss in advisory fees and says it plans to moderate buybacks. Right, take a look at how Asian markets are trading at the moment. A little bit of a mixed picture as we're seeing Japanese equities coming back online, up four-tenths of one percent. Of course, we've been watching the Japanese yen with that little bit of strength that we're seeing in the U.S. dollar as well. The Kospi still gaining two-tenths of one percent. We have the Korean won leading the losses in the previous session. The ASX 200 holding steady after closing above that 8,000 level for the first time ever, still around those record highs. Of course, a lot of risks for Asian markets, including not only weaker than expected Chinese data, but of course the upcoming U.S. presidential elections. Let's bring in Andrew Tilton, chief APAC economist at Goldman Sachs, who joins me today in the Tokyo studio. Welcome. 
Thank you. Great to be here. I mean, we're here in Tokyo, but we just can't really not talk about what's happening on the other side of the Atlantic. We're talking about the U.S. presidential elections and, of course, the implications for the Fed. Given how much momentum former President Trump is picking up, are you factoring in the potential of more tariffs and what that would mean for Asia? We certainly think that a Trump win would mean higher average tariff levels and probably a stronger U.S. dollar as a result. That was how the dollar traded Trump in the primaries and to some extent in recent events. The, there's, a, there's kind of a tug of war here between the election where prediction odds are shifting in favor of President Trump over the last couple of weeks and the Fed where softer inflation and a little bit softer growth data are pushing in the direction of rate cuts, which might mean a weaker dollar. So far, the dollar's been a bit softer over the past week, but we don't think a Trump election win is fully priced. Clearly, there's still some uncertainty there, and we'll re that will remain to be seen over the next few weeks. So if you're making the calculations of a poten potential uh, Trump White House, and you're thinking about the potential tariff scenarios coming from there and the fiscal policies, what is the biggest transmission mechanism on how it affects economies in Asia? Is it through what the Fed does, yields the dollar? I think it's, number one, the tariffs, and number two, the Fed. So on tariffs, again, unclear exactly what Trump would do if he wins, but, but certainly would expect a higher level of tariffs than with the second Biden administration. That would suggest a slightly greater or significantly greater growth challenge for some economies, particularly China, where exports have been very strong. Uh, on the other side, uh, a higher tariffs and a little bit more inflation might mean fewer Fed cuts than you would get otherwise. So that also could push in the direction of a stronger dollar were Trump to win. So those things, I think, are the key transmission channels for Asia, the tariffs and the impact of the Fed. Right now, EM central banks in Asia in particular are waiting to cut rates. Many of them are in a position domestically to cut. Inflation's low, growth's been mixed, sometimes soft, but most would prefer to see the Fed get mm -hmm. going and perhaps have some more clarity in the election as well. Is your understanding that the Fed will actually get going in September? Yes, it really seems we are setting up for a couple of rate cuts this year, uh, potentially one as soon as the late July, uh, the, the meeting later, uh, the, the next the upcoming meeting. But certainly we think by September the Fed will be in, in cutting mode. That's the message from, from Governor Powell. Are you altering your uh, calculations for how many cuts next, we, next year? No, we still expect a quarterly pace of rate cuts though that is somewhat contingent on the election. If we did see, uh, again, President Trump come back and a significant level of tariffs, that could mean that the Fed stops shorter at a higher level of rates than otherwise. Stronger U.S. dollar, weaker Asian currencies, but how much is, say, the PBOC willing to tolerate? Well, China has its own set of challenges. We're really seeing a huge divergence between weak domestic activity and very strong exports. Uh, export volumes up well in the double digits year over year, even as policymakers are being relatively conservative about the domestic support. Uh, PBOC actually pushing back on lower rates, in part because of concerns about the currency, but in part because of concerns about what the signal low rates might send about you know, pessimism about the state of the economy. So in the case of China, we're really focused on the third plenum meetings this week where we'll set out a reform agenda for the next five years. We're not expecting a, a kind of big bang policy stimulus, but certainly we'll learn a lot more about the focus areas for economic policy over the next five years. And what do you expect those focus areas to, to be, Andrew? Is it still that, that watch on those new economy drivers? And, and how sustainable is that when you also have rising protectionist policies coming through, not only from the US, but, but Europe as well? Well, exports and building, continuing to build up the technological capability and the manufacturing sector will remain a priority. There will likely be some emphasis on fiscal reforms. Local governments are under very significant financial pressure. The central government will need to borrow and spend or transfer more. Uh, we could see tax reforms as a part of that. And of course, given the state of the housing sector and the desire to limit down, further downside risk to the housing sector, we could see measures to try to 
allocate fiscal resources to putting a floor under activity in that sector of the economy. So those are a few uh, potential focus areas for the third plenum this week. We'll get a readout on Thursday and potentially more detail next week. What more do you think can be done to support the property sector? Well, fiscal resources are likely to be required. There's a huge amount of vacant uh, property, both in terms of property people already purchased as investment property and in terms of unsold inventory. Governments may need to step in and purchase and either convert inventory to rental housing or even in some cases demolish inventory to rectify the supply-demand balance in some cities, particularly in lower-tier cities where population dynamics tend to be more adverse. Population is peaked and, and maybe declining in rural areas and, and some lower-tier cities, even as it continues to grow in upper-tier cities, in larger cities where there's more of an opportunity to eventually fill that vacant inventory. When it comes to propping up consumption, really, uh, that's another issue that we're seeing here in Japan, right? Mm -hmm. That the economy in trying to ease monetary policy enough to really spur that demand. That are we seeing a virtuous cycle finally form? Is everything that the BOJ has done, that the government has done, been enough to actually change the cycle into a virtuous one of sustainable inflation? Well, for consumption in particular, we've seen a key inflection point in Japan recently. Wage growth is accelerating above inflation. For several years, inflation was higher than wage growth. Real wages were falling. Real purchasing power was declining. But with overall inflation gradually decelerating to around 2%, and the most recent statistics on wage growth accelerating above 2%, in basic wage growth 2.5%, you're now starting to see a dynamic in Japan that you saw a little earlier in other economies, which is positive real wage growth. So we think that'll be very supportive of consumption growth going forward and help to support a moderate level of inflation in the future. In particular, we see you know, services prices and wage inflation picking up, even as goods inflation is falling. And yet, I feel that households don't feel as confident to go out and spend if you see household spending numbers. So when we talk about real wage growth starting to turn positive, when will that really affect the psyche of Japanese people where they will actually go out and spend? And now that we're also facing the possibility that the BOJ might hike rates again at the end of the month, I've even heard people talking about mortgage rates going up in this country where there was virtually zero rates to contend with. The real wage dynamics, we think, are going to dominate the interest rate dynamics, at least in the short run. Of course, that assumes that we'll see a more acceleration of wage growth, reflecting this year's Shinto negotiations in a relatively strong labor market. If we see you know, continued wage growth in the 2 to 3 percent range and inflation settles around 2, it's not going to be you know, really robust, but that will be positive real wage growth, and that should fuel at least a modest improvement in consumption after several tough years. To some extent, household expectations are a little backward looking. I mean, we've, in many countries, this isn't just a Japanese thing, you have had several years where real purchasing power was falling. Expectations and, and, and sentiment probably doesn't turn around overnight after that. Andrew Tilton, Chief APAC Economist at Goldman Sachs, thanks so much for your insights. And as we were discussing there, the third plenum in China underway and that focus really on, on the manufacturing, the high-tech sectors, how these are going to help rewire China's economy, the advances in EVs and, and semiconductors there as well. That is the focus of today's Big Take and subscribers can read the story in full on the terminal and on Bloomberg.com. What's interesting as well, uh, set against the backdrop of the third plenum, has been that weakness in the Chinese economic data. And uh, we've seen outflows from the U.S. ETFs that are tracking Chinese equities picking up. They have been persisting for, for a period now, but last week we actually saw those outflows getting even greater. And you can add to the economic concerns, the concerns around uh, Donald Trump possibly returning to the White House. Let's get more now with our chief correspondent, Min Min Lo, joining us here in Hong Kong. And, and Min Min, what are markets more concerned by the economy in China or the prospect of Donald Trump being re-elected? 
Yeah, it's really a confluence of many factors because you saw those outflows were hitting record high in the US so far. And, you know, you heard Andrew Tilton from Goldman Sachs saying earlier that divergence in the domestic economy with very weak retail sales and domestic consumption and very strong exports, which is also a vulnerability of the Chinese economy because a Trump win could lead to this, you know, potential trade war 2.0 and more tariffs, 60% tariffs on Chinese goods that could hit those exports and perhaps cause even further devaluation of the yuan. So there's a lot of caution in the markets right now. People waiting and see what would be unveiled at the third plenum and also in that July Politburo meeting as well at the end of the month. And also bear in mind that Goldman Sachs had just revised down China's growth forecast as well to 4.9% from 5% after that very weak data coming out yesterday. Yeah, you've got that geopolitical overhang and, and what's been one of the really big areas or it, it, things that's developed off the back of that has been how we've seen that growing relationship between China and the Middle East and, and the different ways that that's being expressed. And, and one of them is through ETFs and, and the new ones that are listing today. That's right. So China had approved the listing of two funds in Shanghai and Shenzhen. They will track the CSOP Saudi Arabia ETF that debuted in Hong Kong last November. We are seeing quite positive outlook for this because uh, CSOP has said that uh, they had about 20,000 individuals and funds taking allocation in these uh, the ETF uh, in a seven-day offer period. And of course, as you said, this is the deepening of financial ties that China has with Saudi Arabia amid what they see as Washington trying to to politicize and weaponize economic policies. And of course, this cross-listing of the ETF will also be beneficial for those funds to tap into that 200 million retail investors in China who are very hungry for overseas ETFs at a time when there is a domestic market slump and you have you know, a property crisis that has kept uh, households and retail investors from putting too much money into property. And the next step perhaps could be maybe the launch of more feeder funds and Hong Kong could be a beneficiary as well because, you know, the, the, the Saudi-China ETF Connect could ultimately also feed back into the Hong Kong ETF as well. All right, that was our China correspondent, Min Min Lo there. We'll have more ahead on the Asia trade. This is Bloomberg. Take a look at how uh, some of these Japanese retailers are trading at the moment. It's a bit of a mixed picture. We have the supermarket chain Aeon uh, reporting results for the first quarter with operating income missing the average analyst estimate. Of course, we have been talking just now with Goldman Sachs about how wage growth is starting to happen in uh, this country, but at the same time, spending has remained sluggish, something uh, that perhaps we can see in other uh, some of those other retail names. Uh, we are seeing at the moment ASICs, though, surging uh, the most in two months after results. Uh, we are also seeing the likes of Ryohin Keikaku, though, gaining ground 6%. Remember, this is a company that owns uh, Mujirushi as well, and we're seeing it uh, really jump by the most in about a year, Bell. And what else we're tracking this morning are shares of Rio Tinto because they're a bit under pressure today, down 2%. The company says second quarter shipments of iron ore rose modestly. That's even as Chinese demand softened, while the company's copper output as well jumped by almost a fifth. Our metals and mining reporter Paul Alain Hunt joins us now. And Paul, yeah, as we can see there, I mean, investors aren't too impressed with those results coming through. Why is that? What did they say exactly to investors? It's unclear, but China has been uh, an issue for uh, many of those in the iron ore industry over the longer term. If we look at uh, Rio Tinto's portfolio and uh, sort of what makes up the business, 60% of its portfolio is iron ore. And where does that go? China, of course. Uh, and in China, uh, we have seen uh, a little bit of sluggishness when it comes to uh, uh, steel manufacturing. Uh, steel consumption was down 7% over April and May. Uh, steel production down 5% year on year. Uh, but steel exports, offsetting that, are up 16%. Uh, and also uh, their manufacturing industry um, has helped buffer some of the property woes in China. But longer term, if you look at the amount of iron ore that's uh, coming into the market, uh, 
Rio Tinto alone has five major backfill uh, projects in the Pilbara of Western Australia where it will develop um, a lot more iron ore for the Chinese market. And of course, Simandu, its massive uh, iron ore project in Guinea, in Africa, that's set to come online in 2025. And eventually that'll deliver another 60 million tonnes per annum to the, to the market. Uh, so it does have some uh, concerns that the iron ore price uh, could fall uh, next year. That's, uh, that's a lot of analysts uh, are, are predicting that. Uh, guidance for the full year in terms of iron ore for Rio Tinto from the Pilbara alone is uh, 323 to 338 million tonnes. Uh, so that could be it. It was uh, an interesting uh, quarterly report from uh, Rio today. They summed up China in, uh, in essentially one word, in one paragraph, which was muted demand. Uh, so yes, quite interesting. Mm. 60% of the revenue coming from iron ore is a huge chunk, but that also means that they produce other metals like copper, aluminum. How well have they diversified so far? Yeah, really interesting point. I mean, copper is something that everyone's talking about uh, at the moment. Of course, uh, copper was the reason why uh, Rio Tinto's rival uh, uh, BHP went after Anglo-American. Uh, it was all about the copper portfolio. So Rio, uh, Rio Tinto itself is a, is a major uh, copper producer. Uh, copper production for this quarter was 18% higher uh, than the quarter of uh, for the, then the same period of 2023. Uh, so that was 171,000 tonnes of the red metal. Uh, a lot of that came from uh, Oyu, Oyu Tolgai, which is their uh, uh, a project in Mongolia. It's been dubbed the Green Mountain. It's a massive underground uh, copper mine. Uh, Kennecott as well in the US, that's in, uh, in Utah. Uh, they've spent a lot of money building up uh, the Kennecott project and for the first time time in 40 years they've returned to underground mining there. So we saw a 30% increase in production at Kennecott and um, at Escondida in Chile uh, a 12% rise in copper production and that was all to do with the grade there. So yes, in terms of copper they've done a, a, a brilliant job in, in pushing out uh, higher volumes uh, into a market that, uh, that many speculate is, is only going to get uh, more hungry. Demand, of course, for, for copper being uh, highly conductive is important for uh, electrific uh, electrification, uh, so for decarbonisation and, and uh, tackling climate change. So demand will soar. Uh, and also in lithium, uh, Rio Tinto is probably one of the only major, well, is, is one of the majors that's looking at uh, and developing, actively developing lithium, uh, unlike BHP, which has stayed away from lithium. Uh, Rio Tinto expects mm. uh, first lithium carbonate from its Rincon project in Argentina. That's despite a sluggish lithium market. All right, that was our metals and mining reporter Paul La Hunt there and uh, we are actually just taking a look at how metals are faring so far in the session. We are seeing a broad weakness really coming in so far. It tracks what we had yesterday because we saw the, the economic from fig figures from China disappointing investors. You had that undershoot on the GDP but also important for the likes of iron ore for instance is what we saw in home prices and those fell again in June. So certainly uh, it ind indicates that challenges that policymakers are facing to arrest the slowdown. Oil as well also in focus. You've got Brent crude very steady there around $85 a barrel. Uh, you do have the US dollar, those moves plus monetary policy, Jay Powell's comments in focus. We'll have more ahead on the Asia trade. This is Bloomberg. say we didn't gain any, any additional confidence in the first quarter, but the three readings in the second quarter, including the one from last week, do add somewhat to confidence. On inflation, we in the first quarter, we didn't, we didn't make any more progress. We've had now three better readings, uh, and if you average them, it's, it, that's a pretty good pace. The U.S. economy has performed really remarkably well over the last couple of years. Today, I'm not going to be sending any signals one way or the other on any particular meeting. So 
just to ruin the fun right at the beginning. We're going to make these decisions meeting by meeting, and we're going to make them on the basis of the data as they come in, the evolving data, the evolving outlook, and also the balance of risks. Fed Chair Powell speaking with Bloomberg Health and Carlisle co-founder David Rubenstein at the Economic Club of Washington. And his comments, of course, sent U.S. stocks higher. Expectations that inflation is being reined in and that we will see the Fed rate cut coming soon. But no clear timing when it comes to the first rate cut. U.S. futures extending those gains that we saw in the New York session. But what we're watching will be Chinese futures are closed in the red. We had, of course, a weaker economic data, including growth at the slowest pace in five quarters and perhaps some indication of a trading in today's session bell. Chinese ETFs in the U.S. are really hit overnight by bets that President Trump will win a second term as well. Yeah, we've got him naming his presidential VP pick, J.D. Vance, as well. That's uh, something else that investors are digesting. But here is what we're seeing in the FX space, because we saw that dollar strength coming back in. Again, it was off those Jay Powell comments saying the data is adding to their confidence around inflation. So you're seeing weakness across the G10 space is actually being led by the, the Japanese yen here, declining two tenths of one percent. So tracking or adding to those losses from yesterday. Also, of course, continuing to watch the euro. You've got that EC B decision in focus in the days ahead. But that's it from the Asia trade. Our markets coverage continues as we look ahead to the start of trade in Hong Kong, Shanghai and Shenzhen. The China show is next. This is Bloomberg.